What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Links and Locks podcast, the DFS edition. I am Jason Sobel from Golf Bet here at Augusta National Golf Club in the press building right now, which is why we have to speak with some hushed tones. I can't yell like I usually do from the home office. And so uh, beautiful view here just overlooking the back of the Augusta National driving range. Cannot wait for the greatest week in golf to get started here alongside with me, as always, Len Hochberg from Rotowire. We are here to break down our favorite DFS plays of the week. Len, what's going on? And I can honestly say, wish you were here. Well, that makes two of us, uh, Jason. I'm very jealous. Uh, I'm just thrilled to be just talking masters and thinking masters, but to, to be on the site is, is next level. So um, I just want to know from you, what is, what is the vibe, the tiger, the everything? What is going on there? Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of intrigue, a lot of plot twisting right now. And of course, Tiger Woods is, uh, is story 1A, 1B, and 1C right now. And it's uh, very interesting to see. We're recording just after noon on Monday afternoon. And uh, I believe Tiger Woods is going to play. I, I'd be very, very surprised, Len, if he showed up for a second trip here at Augusta National, practiced in front of patrons, in front of his fellow players, had a press conference on the interview schedule, which is scheduled for Tuesday afternoon, or excuse me, Tuesday late morning, and then didn't play in this event. So I, I'm expecting Tiger Woods to be playing. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on here. Maybe that takes a, a little the the bullseye, the target off some other players, especially maybe Rory McIlroy, who has tried so hard in vain to win this tournament and capture that career grand slam. So maybe that's a benefit for him. Let's get into it from a DFS perspective, let's start before we talk about individual players. Let's talk game theory a little bit. There's uh, millions to be had out there. And so I think we have to differentiate a little bit when we talk about uh, GPPs. We're talking about those uh, those big money games where you're looking for that big lottery ticket that could hit and cash games this week. And so uh, for those who aren't necessarily playing golf uh, on DFS on a weekly basis, why don't you go through sort of the game theory for each and how it differs and what people should be looking to uh, looking to do this week and how they can find some success. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing is that, uh, you know, the, the winner of the masters tends to be a really good golfer. I mean, it sort of sounds counterintuitive or obvious or something, but you know, the last, uh, well, I think it's uh, almost every year, the winner comes from top 12 in the world. I think seven of the last 10, I think going back the entire century of the, since 2000, I think it's 15 of 21 have been ranked in the top 12, something very close to that number. So um, yeah, obviously you want to identify who is going to win the tournament. This is, I don't think this is a week for a balanced lineup. Uh, certainly, if you want to get something really big, you want to win a big game and stuff, you know, the GPPs, the, you're going to find your, if I can say, the, the better players, the Sharks, if you will, and you can get, you know, you know, the prizes go up to a million dollars, whatever. And, um, you know, you really have to try and find uh, ownership differential. You're looking at um, who's highly owned, who's not. Uh, cash game a little little uh, less cutthroat and stuff. I think you you're you're maybe the players are not quite as advanced in fantasy. You can do better. You can win uh, there. Generally, the thinking is for cash games, maybe more novice beginner players go from there. And so uh, you know, find what's your comfort level and stuff. But uh, ultimately, no matter which game we're in, you've got to pick the good golfers. There you go. Pick good golfers. It's very good game theory. I like that. All right, let's start with the good golfers on the board this week. Very interesting. I thought that John Rahm is no longer the number one player in the world, but he is the betting favorite. And yet the number one player in the world, Scotty Scheffler, is atop uh, the salary board this week on DraftKings for DFS. Scheffler at 11,000. Rahm just behind him at 10,800. Not a, a massive difference there. Call it. Very interestingly, by Dustin Johnson at 10-5, Justin Thomas at 10-3, Colin Morikawa at 10-2, Victor Hovland 10-1, and Rory McIlroy rounds out those in the five digits at 10,000 this week. Any of these guys, all of these guys, some of these guys, players that you're looking at, or, or what are you looking to do here? Yeah, I am definitely looking at some of them, and it, it was a little hard to, to narrow it down. 
Uh, I was a little surprised that Scheffler is ahead of uh, a Rom here on the DraftKings Sportsbook. He is not ahead of John Rom is clearly the, the favorite there. Um, you know, Scotty Scheffler has played this tournament twice. He's finished 18th. He's finished 19th. Okay, there's a learning curve for a lot of guys. It's hard to come out and deliver right away at, at this track. But uh, I'm a little scared to, to stay away from Scotty Scheffler. He just seems to be answering every uh, call, every bell. And, uh, you know, I, I think he has to be in the equation. I, I just think the, I, I like John Rom more. Uh, John Rom top 10 at this tournament four straight years uh clearly is just everywhere but knocking on the door everywhere but there but winning and um you know i i certainly like those two guys most i was a little surprised to see dustin johnson that high um colin morikawa and victor hovland i guess if i would sort of fade and that's probably too strong a word any of the two any guy in this group it might be those two guys yeah, I mean, I look, I don't want to fade any of these players. It's not like I dislike them. It's not like any of them can't win. There's a reason why they're superstar golfers. There's a reason why they're priced what they are. We're going to get into the guys in the 9,000s in just a minute, and I don't think there's a significant talent drop-off there at all. So what I would suggest to people is, look, if you really like a Scheffler, you really like a Rom, don't be afraid of them. There, there's plenty of guys to go after further down the board and fit them into your lineup, but quite frankly – uh, Justin Thomas is the only one that I'm looking at from this price range where I say, yeah, I feel really strongly about that. I think JT is going to be very much in the mix this week. Maybe I'll have a little bit of ROM, but other than that, I, I probably won't have these guys. And it's less about them and more about the players just below them. I do think that there are players in the 8,000s and 9,000s that, like I said, the, the talent drop-off isn't that much. I think you can, uh, you can chase guys at a, uh, a shorter price, a, a bigger value, who are just beneath them. Let's say, talk a little bit about some of those guys. Len, we've got Cameron Smith, 9,900, right below him, Jordan Spieth, Xander Shoffley, Patrick Cantley, Brooks Kepka, Deki Matsuyama, Will Zalatoris, Bryce DeChambeau, and Daniel Berger. Like I said, that, that's not a drop-off. I mean, you could essentially take those names, put them in a hat with the names that I mentioned that are 10,000 above and go, I, okay, I, you know, you can slot anybody in anywhere. And so, this is the reason why I'm not necessarily paying up for those uh, those guys we mentioned earlier, because I am going to take uh, probably at least two of these guys in most lineups that I'm making. Yeah, uh, you, you're right. There's not much of a drop off. Cameron Smith just outside the 10,000. I'm surprised to see him that low, uh, $9,900. Cameron Smith was my preseason pick to win the Masters. Uh, I was a little disappointed in, on, in that vein to see him win the players. Because going winning the players and the masters in back to back starts is going to be quite a feat. And wow, if he could pull that off. You know, you mentioned last time we were talking Brooks Kepka, and he really wasn't super high on my radar, but you made me go look at him, and he's on my radar now. I mean, we all know that, you know, it's uh, he, he shows up for the big tournaments and stuff. Uh, so I definitely like him as well. Uh, Will Zalatoris at 9,200, he, did, he didn't really come close to winning. Hideki sort of had that last year, but to finish runner up in your first Masters, um, you know, it's very interesting. Talk about game theory. I think I sort of whiffed on your question there a, a few minutes ago, but, you know, last year, Hideki number one, Will Zalatoris finished second. Um, neither one a good putter, neither one a good putter, but what both of them are pretty good at are, you know, first of all, tee to green, but, but scrambling as well. Hideki for as bad a putter as he is really good scrambler. I think that you can get away at the, at the masters with a little bit of subpar putting, but you can't get away if you can't scramble. If you're not going to be able to play your wedges around the greens, you're going to be in big trouble there. And that's so Will Zalatoris, despite being a terrible putter statistically, can still make a dent in this tournament. Yeah, I'm totally with you there. This range, uh, 9,900 is some of my favorite golfers in the field. I've got Kepka Cantley 1-2 on my list right now. And um, uh, those are guys that I'll have a big investment on this week. I really like them. Really like Jordan Spieth at 9,800. I don't think there's much fall off uh, from guys like Amora Kawa, who's uh, 400 more or Dustin Johnson who's 700 more. I, I think that you can be pretty confident in putting Jordan out there, led the field in 
strokes game T to green, the Valero Texas open last week. I don't mind Xander. Uh, and, and I really like Will Zalatoris as well. Like you said, uh, I kind of figured it out very quickly last year. I know that we all talked about experience being a narrative here at Augusta national, but what we found over the last handful of years is that the young kids are really, really good. They come out ready to win and they come out ready to play in the big events uh, without having to experience them uh, for years and years before they can play well. We saw it with Spieth, and we've seen it now with Zalatoris, and I, I have no reason to believe that he can't once again contend for this title and finish somewhere in the top five. So I'll have a lot of Zalatoris as well. Looking down to the 8,000s, I, I think you can find some value here. Sam Burns is a guy at 8,600. I like him in the outright marketplace. I like him for a first-round leader play. I like him for prop bets. And I absolutely like him for DFS this week. I think 8,600 is a really nice number for a guy who, after his win a few weeks ago in Tampa, it squeezed into the top 10 in the world ranking. And yet he's below guys like a Shane Lowry, like a Taylor Gooch. I think that's a little bit of a slap in the face to Sam Burns, quite honestly, who is a really, really talented player. Go down the list too. Uh, Tony Finau. I've talked about him a lot already this week. And I think Finau is a guy that, those of us in, in the industry, those of us who uh, study and research this stuff on a, a regular basis will say, well, Tony hasn't played his best golf. He's made nine starts. Then his finish of 19th was at Kapalua. There are only 38 guys in that field. The analytics aren't great. And you sort of tend to think about Tony in a way where uh, he's not playing great. I, I think a lot of people who, like I said, helicopter in for the Masters and only pay attention to this stuff once a year are going to look at Tony Fina and go, huh. He's really good. He always plays well. 8,100, nice price. I'm going to take him. And so I, I think that you can almost learn, have, have learned too much and know too much about Tony Fino. I think uh, oversimplifying it might be the best strategy this week. And just go, Fino's played this event four times. He's got three top 10 finishes. He always plays well. Take him. And I think it's a really nice price if you can uh, get yourself to forget about what we've seen from him over the last three months. He plays well at this course, even with a dislocated ankle. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, he's a t he's a tough call. He's a tough call for me. And that, and just what a fantastic price. I mean, almost in the sevens there. So, uh, yeah, there were a couple of guys like that. Xander Shoffley, obviously a lot more higher price than Tony Fino, but also not playing super well. But great course history here. Tony Fino. Uh, these are tough calls. These are really tough calls for me. Uh, you know, uh, and, I, and I could see them playing well this week because this is different from any other week. The Masters are different. You just the vibe is different. Um, and, you know, and we've seen some guys just sort of find themselves here this week. Um, I kind of like, uh, you know, notice what you saw that Sam Burns is below Taylor Gooch. Taylor Gooch at 8,700. Uh, a little bit surprising to me. Um, but I do like Burns, even though, you know, winners, uh, rookies don't win here. He doesn't have to at $8,600. Um, another guy like Shane Lowry at 88. Uh, he has not been great here through the years. He's been decent top 25s, but he's really playing well all year coming in really does seem to play his best in the big tournaments. And again, he doesn't have to win to justify his price of $8,800. Yeah, I like that. Uh, let's go down to the 7,000 range here. And there's a lot of players that I still like here. And I think there's a tremendous amount of value here. The best iron player on the PGA Tour so far this season is not Colin Morikawa. It's not Justin Thomas, not Will Zalatoris, not even Corey Connors. It's Russell Henley leads the PGA Tour in strokes gained on approach shots. He's at 7,800. Now, the ceiling might be a little lower than it is for some other players. I don't know that Russell Henley can go out and win this golf tournament, but I think he can play really, really well. And I really like that price on him at 7,800. Uh, very, very similar. The best player strokes gained total so far this season is not John Rahm. It's not Scotty Scheffler. It's Matt Fitzpatrick. Strokes gained total essentially tells you who's playing the best. I know everyone likes to look at wins. They like to look at money earned and FedEx Cup points and all those kind of things. Strokes gain total is a pretty good barometer for who's playing the best golf. Matt Fitzpatrick has that number right now, that number one in that category. He's at 7,700. I think those are some smash plays right now when I'm looking at it. Moving down to 7,000s, Corey Connors, yes, ball striker, second shot golf course. Billy Horschel has not played great here over the years, but he's 
in the top 15 in the world right now. So I'm playing some of the best golf of his life. I wouldn't be surprised to see him turn it around a little bit. Mark Leishman's got some value. Max Homa's got some value. Robert McIntyre was 12th here in his first start last year. And then Luke Liss is doing the proverbial sleeping in his own bed narrative this week. He's third on the PGA Tour in strokes gained tee to green. Hasn't played great golf since his win at Torrey Pines a few months ago, but I would not be surprised to see Luke List have a nice week as well. Yeah, I'm with you on Russell Henley, and I was very surprised. He hasn't played here in a few years. He hasn't qualified, but when he's gotten here, he's played pretty well through the years. He's had some top 15s, finishes in that range. Uh, it stands to reason that a guy who's a great iron player will, uh, you know, be uh, in the mix or, or somewhere uh, toward the to top half of the leaderboard on the, on the, in this field. So, yeah, I do like Russell Henry. Matt Fitzpatrick, you know, came here a number of years ago and he finished seventh and you thought, OK, this is the start of something good here. But he really hasn't come close to that in, in the last four or five years. But again, his game right now is being he's playing so well uh, in so many ways um, that I do think that, uh, that he could really get to seventh place or even higher again. And he's only seventy seven hundred dollars. Corey Connors a little bit concerning to me. He's been playing a lot of golf. He, you know, he made it all the way through the, the you know, played the maximum number of matches at the match play. Uh, made the, you know, won the third place match. Then he played all four rounds at the, at the, at the Valero, almost said Valspar at the Valero last week. Um, I'm a little worried if he's going to be uh, still fresh for this week. And Justin Rose, Justin Rose always plays well here was sort of in the, he was in the lead. He was for a big chunk of last week, uh, last year. Uh, he's, you know, 7,500. He could be a part of a, a, a lot of lineups and, um, you know, I kind of think Seamus Power at 7,200 is, uh, he's a master's rookie, but he's not a kid. He's 35 years old. I think he might be able to handle the situation maybe then better than, than, than some of the young, younger players who seem to handle it well anyway. So um, there's just a, a lot here. And, and I, at this point, I'll say, as we're about to get into the 6,000s, roughly two thirds of the guys are going to make the cut. There are a lot of these guys that we're talking about. I mean, there are 91 golfers, 13 of them are the older champions in the amateurs, and one or two might sneak in. But really, we're talking about 77 or 78 guys, and 50-plus ties will make the cut. Two-thirds of these guys are going to make the cut. Most of the guys we're talking about, unless we're having a really bad week, are going to make the cut. So a lot of op options down lower in, in this uh, field. Yeah, absolutely. Usually when we look at the guys in the 6,000s and say, okay, maybe we can find a couple of diamonds in the rough. Uh, this week, because it's a major championship, because it's a limited field major championship, we're going to find plenty of players that we're well familiar with. And so if you're paying up for a couple of those big timers up top, you might need a couple of sh uh, cheaper guys to fill out the bottom of the lineup. And there's plenty of options here. I, Gary Woodland's been playing really nice golf. He's 6,900. Uh, Kevin Kisner is going to be a very popular play. I played his home course, Palmetto, just yesterday. And you can see how that course is about half an hour from Augusta National would set up for a guy to uh, prep his way towards playing this golf course this week. So uh, I do like Kisner. I expect him to be very popular. He's uh, just a popular player amongst the masses. And uh, I don't think we'll uh, – I think we'll see him in a lot of lineups this week. Tom Bogey has some great ball striking numbers so far this year. Again, you're looking for those ball strikers this week. And then I'll throw out Stuart Sink, who's got a really nice record at Augusta National, finished in 12th place a year ago. Hasn't played his best golf lately, but he hasn't been terrible either. He was actually seventh in Tampa just a few weeks ago in his most recent start. So Stuart Sink, a Georgia guy, I could see him up there as well. And at 6,400, certainly the price is right. Yeah, no, I have, I have synced on my radar as well. Uh, you know, uh, again, he's played this course so many times. He what does he know the course as well as Tiger Woods? Well, probably not. Nobody does. But you've been you've been here twenty plus years playing this tournament. You're going to figure out every nook and cranny and and, and such. Uh, going up back higher a little bit. I like Kevin Na at sixty eight hundred dollars. Um, you know, even though this is a super long course, over 7,500 yards, and some say it really plays like 78 or even 79 with all, 
all the undulations and hills and everything on the course. But you, I think, you know, as you say, a guy like Kevin Kisner can succeed at this course. And a guy like Kevin Na can succeed at this course. And Kevin Na has succeeded. He's, he's never had a top 10, but he's had a bunch of finishes around 12th, 13th. That would be fantastic return on your investment for $6,800. And to go all the way down um, to almost to the bottom, $6,200, Charles Schwartzel, Former champion, 2011. He also finished third one year. He's terrible this season. I mean, I don't know if he's making any cuts so far in 2022, but he had a top 25 here a couple of years ago, 25th and 26th the year uh, last year. Uh, there's something about this course where he can make his way around it and do okay. Uh, you know, not going to expect great things from him, but it's $6,200 if he makes the cut then you're, you're dealing with house money right there. All right, let's get right to it. We do it every week here on the Links and Locks podcast, Len. Let's make our lineup. I'll give you the first play. Where are you going with your first spot in the lineup this week? I'm very interested. I, I want to see if we're going steady lineup or we're going some, some studs and then some, uh, not scrubs, I know scrubs in the Masters, but some lower price gentlemen this week. I, I'd like to see where you're going with yours. Well, I have to, I mean, I've been touting Cameron Smith all over the place, wherever, uh, you know, and I'm telling my nine-year-old son anyway, that I think Cameron Smith is anyone who'll listen to me. I, he was my preseason pick. I can't, I don't see how I can go anywhere, but here, I think he's even a favorable price. He's not even in the 10,000s. He's the number six player in the world. Um Cameron Smith, 9,900. He's, he, he's been runner up. He's been in the top five twice, top 10, three times. Uh, I expect a good week from him. If I told my son about Russell Henley and his value this week, I guarantee he would put his headphones right on and stop listening to me. But I'm <laughs> going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell our listeners about it because, like you said, he's got a couple of nice finishes. Uh, the ceiling might not be as high as it is for other players in that area, but the floor is. He, he's made every cut so far this season. In fact, I think he's made 15 straight. He's a guy, and I, I've said this before on the podcast, Len, he's like a baseball pitcher who's – 7 and 12 with a 270 ERA. I look at him and saying, you know, there's some positive regression, that oxymoronic statement that at yeah. some point the results are going to come around for him. This is a guy that's he's so he's been so unlucky that at the Wyndham Championship last year, he missed a putt to get into the playoff and still didn't catch top five tickets because six guys reached that playoff. And so he's just had a lot of bad luck, things that have happened, but I do like Russell yeah. Russell Henley a lot this week. So it's 7700, 7800, excuse me. I think that's a really good price. Yeah, I think those are two strong guys to, to start off uh, right away. Um, you know, it sort of looks like we're not going to go to uh, the really high price guys. And I'm thinking that, you know, the, as you mentioned sort of at the top, the guys in the nines, they're big name guys. You know, I think we see every every Masters, there's just too many guys to all be in the 10,000s or even the 9,000s. So even avoiding the 10,000s doesn't mean the stars and gentlemen or whatever you said approach there, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, but so I'm going to go sort of mid-range again, and I, I like this price for Shane Lowry. I've liked him a lot this year. He just seems to have been involved in a lot of leaderboards and playing well. And he, you know, we think of Shane Lowry as this big burly guy but he's really soft. He's got very soft hands around the greens. He's and, and that really might be the one thing more than anything. If you can get yourself out of trouble around the greens with good wedge play, you're going to be in good position more times than not. Shane Lowry, $8,800. Yeah. I like that play. <clears throat> We've got 23 five left for our last three plays. That's 78 33 per man. I'm going to go, right about at that average. And I'm going to trust the numbers once again. I said Russell Henley leads the PGA Tour in strokes gained on approach shots. Matt Fitzpatrick, just below him on the board at 7,700, leads the PGA Tour in strokes gained total. At some point, that is going to relate into some big-time results. I don't know that necessarily he has the equity to win this week, but I'd be surprised if he doesn't at least have a very good, strong week, 7,700 for Fitzpatrick. What if so? We're, we were down to about 15 something. Uh, 15, 8, 7,900 per man. 
Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to go a little <clears throat> low and give you an opportunity to finish it off with a with a with a big with a big finish here. I'm going to throw a name out here. We hadn't discussed him yet. I uh, sort of bypassed him, but I like the price of Si Woo Kim at seventy one hundred dollars. Si Woo Kim has been. Uh, I've always found him in years past to really be an all or nothing guy. He can come out and have a great tournament. So much talent, but just seems to be. Uh, you know, it just seems to have some clunker weeks and stuff. Those have been minimized this year. He seems to be growing, you know, he's now in his mid twenties. He came on the tour really young. He's really stabilizing. Uh, he's had a good history. He's played five masters already, even though he's only 25, 26 years old, he's had three top 25s. You get a top 25 out of a guy who's $7,100. Uh, I, and, and I expect Siwoo Kim to be very low owned. I don't think that we almost didn't mention him here. I don't think he's going to be a popular pick. He might be a little bit of a diamond in the rough there just to get into the top 25. All right. We've got 8,700 left and you're essentially begging me to pick a five-time Masters champion, a player making his return after 17 months away <laughs> to return to competition at the Masters at 8,500. Tiger Woods is sitting right there for the sixth and final spot in the lineup. I'm going to go with Sam Burns, who's never played here before. Oh, my God. What am I doing? What a That's Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan right there. But I'm taking Sam Burns because I just think he's, he's one of the most talented players in the world. I, do I care that he hasn't played here before? Yeah, just a little bit. But I think that narrative's a little bit exhausted as well. I think a guy who's a young player making his first start can certainly learn to get his way around this golf course. And uh, Burns is running hot too. Look, he was right there in the mix of the players championship before a bad final round came back the next week and won the Valspar at 8,600. Sorry, tiger. I'm throwing Burns in that lineup. We've got Burns, Fitzpatrick, Henley, Kim, Lowry, Smith. What do you think, Len? I'm very surprised. I, I like our lineup. I'm very surprised we didn't touch the 10,000s. We didn't touch the 6,000s. If you would have asked me at the beginning if that would have gone that way, I would have said no. We would have gone dipped high and dipped low. But uh, again, to your point, there are guys in the nines and even the eights who were really, really stud golfers. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to go this week. Enjoy it, everybody out there. Remember, you can find the Links and Locks podcast every single week, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Download, subscribe, rate, and listen to us. I'm Jason Sobel from Golf Bet here at Augusta National. He is Len Hochberg from Rotowire. Thanks so much for listening. Good luck with all your DFS plays for this week's Masters Tournament. Man, it just feels good to say it. Here's hoping you guys hit the green.